My guest today is Joel Cochran. Joel, how you doing? I'm great, Dave. How are you? I'm doing great. It's been too long. It's been a really long time. Yeah. It's been a long time since I've seen you in person, and even longer since we've recorded a show. It was uh, you, you just told me what it was. It was, two, two, it was ni- 1972, I think, wasn't it? Yeah, yeah, 72 <laughs> or 73, back then, you know, in the early days of the Internet. <laughs> it was uh, 2012, and we talked about wow. some JavaScript stuff that nobody cares about anymore. <laughs> I'm not sure I agree with that second part of that statement, but uh, let's talk about something today that people definitely care about. Awesome. Because I, I understand you're working with um, Azure Synapse, is that correct? I am, uh, and total accident, but I even wore my Azure Synapse shirt today. So, Oh, awesome. Yep. What is Azure Synapse? Azure Synapse is the next generation of uh, data warehousing inside of, the, of Azure. Right? So it's a fully managed data warehousing tool. Um, but it's, it's well beyond the, the previous versions of SQL data where Azure SQL Data Warehouse, uh, but it also incorporates those. So... I think of Synapse as an umbrella product over a family of related and integrated uh, tools. So dedicated SQL pool will be the thing that most folks are familiar with. So if you've done work on uh, on Azure SQL and you know, in a, a traditional SQL environment, you, you've used SSMS and you've written queries, et cetera, et cetera. The, uh, the big data version of that is SQL Data Warehouse, which is a, mm-hmm. an MPP or massively parallel processing data system built on top of SQL Server technologies. So while it's not a one-to-one uh, relationship, it is very, very close. But you know, if you're comfortable in SQL, you can be comfortable in SQL Data Warehouse. SQL Data Warehouse uh, is now known as dedicated SQL pools under the umbrella of Synapse. So Synapse Mm -hmm. Azure SQL data pools would be the equivalent (laughs) of uh, Azure SQL data warehouse. Uh, Okay, this is interesting. So the the naming is confusing. I remember when I first heard about Azure Synapse, it was nothing more than a rebranding of SQL data warehouse. They hadn't yet added any of the new features, right? Yeah, it's, it's really interesting kind of the arc that it's taken. And that's funny, too, because of, of Azure Arc, but funny in my head. I don't, <laughs> other people probably aren't going to laugh. It's funny to me. Um, so, yes, the, so the original, and, and I'm going to back off of that and say uh, that that's true, but only in the sense of what was publicly exposed. So ah. in the early days of the private preview, the, the, the primary things that we're going to talk about were present. But the first kind of a public exposure to the Synapse brand was when they took Azure SQL Data Warehouse and renamed it Synapse. Ah, okay. All and, right. And now it's gone way beyond that. Now it's uh, a, a yes. entire suite of features of which that old yeah. SQL Data Warehouse was uh, is just one. Yes. So if you had an, an Azure SQL Data Warehouse instance prior to Syn- that was created prior to Synapse or outside of Synapse, you would now see it branded as Azure Synapse parentheses formerly SQL Data Warehouse. I mean, like the you know, it's like the it's like the uh, prince the artist, of yeah, software. Yeah, I was gonna say it's the <laughs> it's the 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 data warehouse formerly known as you know, um, uh, but but Synapse itself. Uh, so if we take one or two steps backwards. SQL Data Warehouse started, I want to say 2014, 2015, uh, with version one, which was really impressive, but pretty limited. Um, mm-hmm. And if we, you know, if we get if we get too far into the weeds, let me know. But it was primarily a uh, really only supported uh, clustered column store indexes. Um, and which meant if you were doing like row level work, joining two different tables, uh, not, I don't want to call it traditional relational stuff because it's still not a, intended to really be a relational database engine, but, you know, joining two different sets of data together because you're doing maybe row level analysis or something like that. Clustered com store index can't really, I mean, it can do that, but it's not great at it, right? Okay. Uh, it's great at large scale aggregations. Uh, large-scale through processing, 
um, but doesn't really do great at that individual row level. So if I had to find David's record in a national level of, of people, um, it's not great at that. Mm -hmm. uh, clustered indexes, however, from SQL Server were introduced in uh, SQL Data Warehouse version 2. Which, which opened up a whole world of the, the kind of work that we do, which is very granular row-to-row -row, uh, joining uh, and lookups and things of that nature, uh, finally made it possible for us to do that. And SQL Data Warehouse solved a lot of problems for us uh, just because of the immense scale uh, and the, and the multi, uh, again, the, the parallel processing that data warehousing brings to the table. So you People equate, they think of it as just a really large SQL server, which is unfair to the ar the underlying architecture. But from the perspective of just being able to run SQL queries against really large data sets, yeah, okay, SQL Data Warehouse is great at that. Um, and it brings with it a lot of the historical stuff from SQL Server. So you have tables, you have well-defined table schemas and column lengths and, and types and all of those things. Of course, you have views. And then it adds on top of it as, again, the, the, the parallel processing portion of it, uh, concepts like uh, hash distribution um, and partitioning and applies that as additional layers on top of again, the, the traditional indexing. Um, and, and if I had slides to show, you would see that that's because of the, the physical architecture under the covers that you can't get to, um, mm. uh, the way that these things are built. So a, a Azure SQL Data Warehouse is actually a collection of 60, that's six zero, SQL servers. And then mm. it's all managed by a head node or a, or a, a, a controller node that parses out both the storage and the uh, the queries, the jobs, uh, to those those 60 different servers, um, which just adds a whole bunch of complexity. Okay, um, but that complexity is it's hidden. It's abstracted away from it's the, abstracted the away, developer, the user. And it's yep. only, I think, if I understand it correctly, it's only really there to increase the scalability. So if I wanted to add lots more data, now I've got 60, 60 different servers to add it to. If I want to add more redundancy, if I want to add uh, more processing power to run my queries, then that, that engine can take care of that for me. Is that a fair statement? It, it is a fair statement. So we're still talking traditional data warehouse. Okay. Um, and in, uh, so, uh, and I want to be clear about that, right? That there's a lot of other stuff in Synapse, but yeah. but if we're just talking regular data warehouse, um, uh, there is, uh, for one thing, it has slider scalability. So uh, it uses sort of the traditional D star U, <laughs> D DWU, data warehouse units, you know, so uh, folks who have been around Azure SQL know, you know, you've, we've had DTUs forever, and they're just sort of this nebulous relative level of performance. Well, right. DWUs are the same concept, and it really has to do with how much horsepower mm -hmm. can the, you know, can the the entire system bring to bear to to solve your problems and run your your there's uh, and run your queries. There's still 60 servers. Whether you're running a hundred DWUs, which by the way I don't recommend, you're you're not going to get a whole lot done at a hundred, but around three hundred, believe it or not, you can start to get some pretty decent performance. And we actually run our production uh, environment at five hundred DWUs. And just for scale, just to, to put that in its relative place, the top end is thirty thousand DWUs. Um, now I'd have to pull up the pricing calculator, but I can tell you I can't afford that. That's a lot. Um, it's a lot. It's a lot. Five hundred will run you around five thousand bucks a month, hmm. um, which is also why I, uh, I recommend reserved pricing if if folks are getting into into that level of commitment in data warehousing. Uh, what is Azure, it reserved pricing? Reserved pricing in Azure allows you to basically pay by commitment as opposed to as you go. So uh, it's it's not an enterprise agreement or, or an MCA or anything like that, but uh, you can for certain things like uh, I believe there's reserve pricing for storage. Uh, they're probably reserved pricing for like Cosmos. Uh, what do they call those RUs or R something U's? Uh, uh, I, I'm not a Cosmos guy, um, but there are a whole bunch of things that you know cost you X number of dollars to be up and running, and mm -hmm. reserve pricing will let you based on your willingness to commit to a future spend will let you reduce that cost. So we've actually, okay. 
because we committed to 500 DWUs uh, a month for three years, it actually cut it down into uh, to 33% of the original cost. Oh, so wow. we can get that for a lot less expensive because we're willing to make that three-year commitment. But I the see. truth is, if you make the three-year commitment, and uh, you break even after the first year. So even if you're only going to do 18 months or two years, it's you're worth still doing, yeah. still making money back. You're still saving money. So, mm. um, so that's, yeah, so that's certainly one thing because it can be, get pricey, obviously, really quickly. Um, and, that's, and that's actually where it starts to get super interesting if we come back to Synapse now. Please. Okay? Yeah. yeah. So, so dedicated SQL pool, it's still really important, um, but it's only one leg of a three-legged stool. That is the processing engines that are available inside of Synapse. The most intriguing one for me uh, is what they call serverless SQL, uh, mm-hmm. or, or they'll also call it built-in. Uh, you'll see it referred to in several different ways. And in the old documentation, in the preview, uh, they called it SQL on demand, which I really like. Um, but what that means is that I can, without creating a, a database, right? So you create databases in your SQL pools. Um, again, very traditional SQL Server-esque kind of things. Without doing that, you can load data to a, an Azure Data Lake uh, storage account. Uh, which again is which is also highly optimized for parallel operations. Uh, and if you go that extra mile and create your store your data in a format that is designed for massive parallel operations like Parquet, um, Parquet is sort of the it, it's it's the hot thing in data storage in, in uh, like Hadoop oriented systems and and Spark and things of that nature because it it parallelizes. Uh, your data across many files, but all the files are aware of the schema. So like all the files mm-hmm. carry with it some intelligence, some metadata about the data itself. And then it's also highly compressed. Mm-hmm. Um, and it, it you can query against those Parquet files in SQLs, uh, in serverless SQL, and you only pay for the amount of, uh, of time that the query is actually running. So you only so you only pay for what you use. It's a pure consumption model, and it's a T SQL language. I mean, it's 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 not the full T SQL language, mm-hmm. right? But but for writing for doing exploratory work, for writing queries, um, and you can even go the other route, and you can you can write data to the data lake through uh, through external tables in the in the serverless environment. But uh, you can. For instance, and this is a scenario that happens in our line of work frequently, we get a CSV file from a customer. We can literally drop it in a storage account, right-click it, and write a query against it. And and hmm. and we haven't done we haven't loaded anything, we haven't run any pipelines, we haven't done any ETL, um, we haven't created a table, we haven't created a schema, but I can right-click and query that, uh, and like immediately so there's some really like just some really can i hate the term low-hanging fruit right but that's kind of what it is it's like this is the the hello world of why you care about serverless sql uh it's literally no translation no transition no processing i'm just querying text files and that, that happens if you have uh is there a configuration to do ahead of time to set up Synapse in order to get functionality like being able to query a CSV file on Azure Storage. So the short answer is no, um, and I'm gonna I'm gonna correct only the only thing that you said there. You said Azure Storage. I'm gonna say Azure Data Lake Storage because those oh. are two different things, right? Data Lake Storage is a uh, built on Blob Storage, but it's not the same because it has a hierarchical. Uh, layer uh, embedded on top of it. It also has uh, different permissions, like the, R- the, the RBAC roles and things like that are, are different. Uh, but when you create your Synapse environment, and we actually created, so we now have multiple Synapse environments going on in uh, here in our uh, in our workload, and we created two of them last week. And to create two of them and to get a storage account. Uh, attached to where to the point that you could be running queries permissions and everything I think the grand total creation time between the two is about 45 minutes mm-hmm. so uh, and that was only because I've only done it once before and I had to remember how to do it <laughs> uh, but but so you can go you can be zero to query in a very short amount of time uh, and when you create that environment one of the things that 
you know, when you're going through those scripts in the portal uh, or those wizards in the portal, one of the things that's part of that process is what Azure Data Lake storage account do you want to use as your primary or default connection? Um, you are not limited to that connection. Uh, there are many, many uh, you can create to you can connect to many of them. And back to the dedicated SQL pool, another thing that's really different between the Synapse approach to the traditional data warehouse approach, you can create multiple pools. So you can have multiple databases in your data warehouse, uh, whereas traditional Azure SQL data warehouse was in itself a database. Mm -hmm. um, so this, yeah, so you can actually, you have more options to segregate your workloads based on the kind of consumption that you want to drive. Um, but the serverless SQL stuff is really impressive. Uh, and we've done a lot of work to take our, our, our large data sets and uh, output them as parquet files. Uh, and then we go in uh, to even take away another layer of cruft because there is um, in order to run those queries, there's a, a thing called an open row set, and it has a little bit of a wonky syntax, and it has to have the long path to the files that you want, and you can alter that with some wild cards, and there's just all kinds of flexibility there. But then you can create a database inside your serverless environment, and again, you could create multiples, and that gives you a place to store uh, artifacts like views. So then mm -hmm. I can create a view over that cruft and remove it entirely where, mm -hmm. so, so now my analysts, when they're running queries, they just pull the view up and to them, it's just a, a regular mm -hmm. SQL statement, select X from wow, this cool. view name. Um, and they are, they are now completely abstracted away from the fact that it's parquet files, that it's Azure data lake storage, um, that it, you know, it isn't a quote unquote real table. Right. But the performance is so fast. So there's not even any tweaking that you do on the serverless side. So you don't go in and say, how many nodes do I want or anything like that. It's it's literally just there. Nice. Yeah. Um, now you said, so we've got the SQL data pools, which is formerly data warehouse. Uh, yes. The SQL, serverless SQL. And you said it's a three-legged stool. So we're missing yes. one, right? The third, yes. The third leg is Spark. Is okay. Spark notebooks, right? So, um, so Spark, uh, you know, for I'm, I'm sure most folks are familiar, but in case you aren't, I don't Spark think that's has, true. I think there's a lot of people that are not familiar. Pro with Spark oh, okay, fair enough, fair enough. Um, it, Spark is the 800 pound gorilla these days of Hadoop implementation. Okay. Hadoop was uh, really one of the first. It's a map reduce environment that is built again on these concepts we've been talking about of massively parallel processing. So. Uh, a Hadoop environment, and there are several other ways to leverage Hadoop inside of the Azure ecosystem, and I'll, I'll bounce through those here in just a second. But Hadoop is uh, very similar to those that layout we were talking about with uh, with SQL Data Warehouse, where there's you configure a head node, and then you, there's a bunch of worker nodes, and then the head node's responsibility or controller node, I think, is the current terminology. The controller node's job is to divvy up the work among those worker nodes and then it takes that data back it takes the results back and aggregates it and sends it to the re back to the requester so you have this kind of throughput that comes in this here goes out here does a whole bunch of work little workloads which is the parallel part right and then brings it back one of the things that's really different with uh, Hadoop environments is that you have to specify mm -hmm. well how many worker nodes am I gonna have um, and, so, and so Spark uh, builds on that. So Hadoop again has been around for quite a while. Um, it had some issues uh, early on and then the people were creating many different right. flavors. It's kind of like Linux where you have many different distros, right? You have many different distributions. There are many different styles of Hadoop, um, but the one that has really taken everybody by storm, and that's another joke because one of the distros is called Storm. Um, <laughs> right. uh, one of the things though that, it, it, that really took off was Spark. And so Spark is a highly memory optimized approach to Hadoop. Really what they do is they load as much, they, they, they create these systems with lots of RAM and they load as much of the stuff as they can into RAM so that right. it performs a lot faster. So you're not doing so much disk I.O. Um, and, and like other Hadoop environments, you, you can go in and say, well, I, I, I want 10 worker nodes. What they really do is they do a scale where they say, well, here are the minimum nodes I want you to run on. And then here's the maximum nodes I want you to run mm -hmm. on. And you go out and 
figure it out for me at runtime and, and within those parameters use the you know optimize your operation for for the number of nodes that you need um, and and you do pay for it's a it's a consumption based environment so you are paying for the number the the amount of core runtime that you're consuming uh, that makes sense. And I, if I, when I've worked with big data, a lot of times it's not the storage that's expensive. It's the actual, the processing, either the queries or the maybe importing data and transforming data. Things that don't happen all day, every day. Things that just happen once in a while. Maybe nightly processes. Maybe reports that are run a couple times a day. And uh, and that's when the consumption model really helps. It, yeah, it really does. It's fantastic. You know, I So uh, I've been using Data Factory for... Mm -hmm. For a long time, I'm a, I'm a huge fan. It's like my my reason for being these days is to automate processes. That's like the they, cloud version of uh, SSIS, I think. Wow! So there's a lot to unpack I know that's, in that I know that's statement. An oversimplification. <laughs> that's an oversimplification, um, but that's it's, it, it serves it that is, role. But it's yes, it serves that role. It's an ETL orchestration manager, uh, is what it is, and it's it, in my mind, it's the best single product that has come out of of Azure in a long time. Strong um, words. It is it is strong words, and I and I'm highly biased because I spend so much time in it, um, but it has really permitted. I mean, where where I where I really see the value is that we are a tiny company. <laughs> what what is your company? Um, so I work for a, a, a data analytics firm called Causeway Solutions. Mm -hmm. It's based out of New Orleans, although we're about half distributed and half in New Orleans. And since the pandemic, of course, we all you know we're technically all distributed. Right. Um, but we process national level data for uh, we do analytics over national data sets. So we have data from a variety of different sources on every adult in the United States. And then we do some uh, artificial intelligence modeling, uh, list generation, uh, okay, it, cool. you know, things, things of that nature. I wanted to allow you um, to give a plug-in for them since you're oh, thank you're, you. Don't make your time to me. I want to give something back to your company. <laughs> For so uh, ten, yeah, so free publicity it, to the tens of users that will be the ten, the, the dozens this. of dozens of people. <laughs> uh, well, thank you for that, and Causeway appreciates that. Uh, they, I will say, you know, first of all, uh, I always say that you know the really smart people in our company, that's what they do. They okay. do the <laughs> analytics. My job is to get the uh, the data ready. You know, so I spend most of my time. I do other things, but but most of my time is uh, in my effort is given to making sure that they have the resources that they need so that they can do that really, really interesting analytics work. Mm. Um, and, uh, and, and again, that's where, back to ADF, it has really been a boon for us because it permits me, and, uh, and most of the time it really is just me. I'm not, I'm not singing my praises. I'm just saying it's the nature of being in a small company. Um, it, but it permits me to get an outsized amount of work done for a single person because mm -hmm. I've been able to automate these processes right. uh, you know, and, and base them on a variety of triggers. Uh, and for the most part, the trains are just running. You know, and right. and I don't I don't have to play conductor all that often, so uh, so it's it's just it's a really it really is a fantastic tool. And when you augment it with things like logic apps and function apps, it just you know it's I'm through the moon over all this. Yeah. Uh, but so 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 the, I'm, I'm gonna I'm gonna put a I'm gonna put a little bookmark in that for just a second. So we have our three legs of the of the stool, right? We uh -huh. have traditional data warehouse. We have serverless SQL and now we have Spark and so those Spark notebooks of course um, can also be automated uh, can you know it could be uh, uh, run you know with um, you know, pass parameters in and run notebooks and, and do all those great things but Spark can also create a database so there's a database in all three of these legs mm -hmm. so those so the Spark environment can create a Spark database and it can from those uh, like from data frames or whatever uh, operations you've got going on inside of your notebook can populate that data and that data gets persisted back into the data lake uh, but it gets but it gets referenced as a spark table well serverless sql can query those spark tables so you have this great little interaction going on between those two things mm -hmm. and because they share the same data lake the spark notebooks can access the same data that the sql serverless environment 
uh, could access. So it can read those parquet nice. files or CSV files directly. Mm -hmm. And through the Scala interface, so I'll, I'll mention that in just a second, but through the Scala portion of the Spark notebook, it can even connect to the dedicated SQL pool and read those tables. So there's a lot of interlacing ability between those three legs. Um, and it's just fascinating. The, the, again, in my mind, it's not that we use every single piece of it, but it's the flexibility. It's the option to solve problems in the best way because the tool's not getting in the way. I see. Yeah. So, the, so I mentioned Scala. If you don't mind, yeah. I'll just jump right into it. Oh, yeah. You're it. a Scala so, guy now, I guess. No, no, no. I'm absolutely not a Scala okay. guy. So, so my first foray into uh, – into object-oriented development was Java, and I swore I would never do it again. Uh, <laughs> and I'm not. I'm not technically doing it again. But what's really interesting about the, uh, the notebook environment inside Synapse is that it natively supports Python, Scala, SQL, and C Sharp. So you can, inside of a notebook, you can actually mix and match those languages cell to cell to cell. Oh, nice. Uh, right. And, and, and R as well, right? Not yet. Oh, okay. Not yet. And, and I say not yet, not because I have any kind of insider information. I don't. Uh, but I can't imagine a scenario where they don't include our support mm -hmm. if they're going to be if they if they want to be a serious player, right? Uh, in in the like in the ML and AI environments in particular, right. uh, which Spark is great at that kind of stuff. And so I'm sure. I'm, well, yes, and so so Python is one of the core languages that they support, and it's the default. When you go in and start a new notebook, the default is PySpark. Okay. Um, but what? But the dirty one of the dirty little secrets. I, I love the dirty little secrets in our industry. One of the dirty little secrets of Spark notebooks is they all get written to Scala. Hmm. So so at runtime, so you might be writing your code in Python, but at runtime, it's actually executing Scala. Hmm. And the same thing is true of the C Sharp. So there's a, and I have, believe, even though I'm a longtime C Sharp developer, I haven't gotten very far into it uh, because Python is pretty amazing for these little code snippets. Right. And all the examples that you're going to find online are, are almost all Python. And there's a lot examples. of good libraries for Python for the data world. There's a lot of great libraries and the Synapse team has already made most of them available to you and they have given you a, a simple facility in the configuration in your spark pool so we haven't talked about spark pools yet right but you create you create a pool uh and, and you can create many pools so you can have a pool that's for you know that's like a really small pool you can have a pool that's a large pool you can have a pool that includes libraries for say geo processing right mm -hmm. or you want to do a bunch of mapping work or right. something like that you could create a pool that includes those extra libraries that you want and it's all run and I for, it's a, it's all run through a thing called PyPy P Y P I um, so if you go to Py, it's, I think it's PyPy.org you'll see all the libraries that are included the Synapse environment will let you specify any of those libraries and versions that are in PyPy, which is like thousands of them. And if you include that reference in your pool, when it spins the pool up, it'll include that library. It's kind of like a, a NuGet package manager for Python libraries. Um, so there's just, again, the amount of flexibility that they built in is amazing. Joel, we're just about at time. What's uh, Is there anything oh, we no. haven't talked about that we should have? Oh, Yes, there's 800 things we haven't talked about. <laughs> well, we Real quick. Another show, but let's wrap up this one. <laughs> all right, let's wrap up this one. So I'm, I did promise I'd come back to ADF. Oh, yeah. So, all, so, so that's the core. And then think of on the outsides uh, around that, you've also got effectively full Azure Data Factory integration into the Synapse environment. Mm -hmm. So you don't have to go to a separate tool to write your pipelines, to connect to mm -hmm. your data lake storage, uh, to do all of those things. You can actually manage those pipelines in the same environment. Uh, and then on the other, so that's on the ingestion and ETL end. And then on the other end, it also has connector, native connectors to Power BI workspaces uh, and Azure Purview is now being built in as well for data governance. So it's it, it really is the future of big data work in the Azure ecosphere. Um, it's it's in my mind going to it's going to replace Databricks. Uh, it's going to you know which is a Spark environment that built on the uh, on the Databricks interface. Um, I just I just I'm I'm just super excited about it, and uh, you know, I spend all my time in it these days. Awesome. Joel, thank you so much for your time. I've learned a lot today. You uh, you stay safe. 
All right, you too. Thanks a lot for having me, Dave. All right. During the pandemic, it's been a real shame that I haven't been able to be with my friends, but at least I've been with my technology.